All right. Welcome, uh, everyone at home, and welcome Shannon Staglin and Artie Johnson, two of my most famous or most favorite people, and famous, obviously, um, favorite people uh, to talk to, um, two people that I count as, uh, as friends. And um, I'm really excited to spend the next half an hour or so uh, talking with you, getting to know you a little bit more, um, letting you folks at home ask your questions. So if you have anything you'd like uh, for us to discuss or you'd like to ask um, Shannon or Artie, you can type it in the chat box and we will address as many questions. And uh, my name is Vanessa Conlin. I am the head of wine for Wine Access. This has been um, a couple weeks now that we've been doing the feel like, especially in these times, you know, even if we can't be sharing a glass together, it's really important to remember that wine was meant to uh, bring people together. It was meant to, you know, uh, enhance the community, to inspire conversations. Um, and so even though we are, we are social distancing, um, we're still gonna have uh, a great discussion about wine and whatever we feel like chatting about. So we'll give people a, a minute or two to, uh, to join us, but uh, how are you two? How are you two doing today? You're having a good day so far. Yeah, good. We're happy to be here with you. You didn't say that you're a master of wine. Now you have to add that to your title. Very important. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're so proud yeah. of you. That's an accomplishment. Thank you. Well, you and your whole family were so supportive of me, and it's um, it really does take a it takes a whole community. <laughs> it takes a village. Takes a village, um, but no, thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, very excited about that. Congratulations. Thank you. thank you. Thanks so much. So, all right. Well, I think you know we've given people a couple minutes to join. So, why don't why don't we get started? I'll just um, welcome anyone who's joined us in the last um, you know couple seconds. Um, my name is Vanessa Conlin, head of wine for Wine Access. Um, and I'm here with Shannon Staglin and Artie Johnson, both of whom are friends of mine, um, brilliant um, people and vintners. And we have three wines we're gonna discuss today. We have Chardonnay, Grenache, and Cabernet Sauvignon. So I'm gonna just pour myself a glass of this Chardonnay. I, I practiced many times before we went live. Le Artichasic. Amazing, that's perfect. <laughs> Wow, that was like a one in ten chance I was going to get that right, but I'm I'm pretty proud right now. <laughs> now this is um, as you can see, this is not my first pour out of this bottle. I actually did taste this. Um, I drank it actually um, before the before we went live, and it's absolutely delicious. So Artie, this is this is your project, right? Really? Wine X Y Z. Um, I'd yes. love for you to tell us about the wine, but what I what I wanted to ask is, obviously. Um, you know, Shannon's fa family is a uh, pretty famous for sh for Chardonnay. So yes. I feel like it took some uh, some cojones to, uh, <laughs> to to make Chardonnay uh, on your own project. So what was that like? And um, tell us about. Yeah. This I hope I'm not in any trouble by making Chardonnay. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, if we may, before we get started, I wanted to to say that as a family, um, our hearts go out to uh, the families that are affected by the pandemic. Um, if you've had a loved one or that you that has passed away or has gotten sick or if you're laid off or or furloughed um, you know our hearts go out to you and we also uh, think about our first responders and, uh, and medical workers out there and and, and uh, also for us as a family winery we really want to acknowledge our distribution partners who kept us going out there FedEx UPS GSO that are yeah. getting uh, the wines to the clients. So uh, it's a humbling time for us as a family uh, and as a family winery. And before we get started, I just want to acknowledge what's going on in the universe. Thank you, Artie. So that, that was be beautifully said. And um, and yet, yeah, cheers to that. And as you said to, to anyone affected by it, um, uh, our hearts go out, go out to you. My pleasure. And um, so, yes, you know, as you were saying, uh, you know, Chardonnay is a big thing in this family, especially with, you know, my mother-in-law and my wife. We're fortunate to have some spectacular Chardonnay here on property. Um, and being in the in the Rutherford bench, we, you know, it's a little bit different climate than the Chardonnay that I'm making here. I chose to go out to the Sonoma Coast. Um, two very special vineyards that I was able to work with. 
This is the 2018 vintage, and these two vineyards are about five miles apart. They're on the Sonoma Coast. One of them, um, I got some really cool old Winty uh, uh, Chardonnay uh, from this site. Ross Cobb and Katie Wilson hooked me up there. And then uh, Steve Ryan over at the, the Wine Foundry hooked me up with the other site. So, you know, one of them has kind of, I would say, a tendency for higher acidity, and then the other one has great exposures. Um, so blending them together uh, gives me kind of the texture that I want, but the brightness that I was looking for as well. Um, for me, I'm not so much into picking green clusters. Uh, I like to have a little bit of color there. Uh, so it's important for me to be in sites um, that are cooler, um, soils that are thinner, um, because I want to hang a little bit longer. And if I get uh, into a warmer site, I worry that I won't be able to maintain the level of acidity that I'm looking for and also have the texture. So hopefully you kind of get both of those those here. And Artie, will you tell the name that's hard to pronounce? Will you tell them the <laughs> Absolutely. So... I think the name kind of ties in uh, a little bit uh, to my role in this family. So the name of the wines are Le Artichastic. This is a project that I have with Shannon, and I actually make these wines. So I'm the winemaker on this project. And I'm fortunate to have kind of a dual professional existence right now. So for the family, for Stagland Family Vineyard, I get to work um, basically in direct-to-consumer sales and strategies. and and those of you who know me well know that I love taking care of clients. So I'm able to bring some of those skills to the table in our family business. And then the Artist Shastik is my creative outlet. Most of these uh, wines are very small production. They're about 200 cases each. I normally work with two ton lots. Um, so that's kind of my role here at Staglin and also with the Artist Shastik as the winemaker. So I bounce back and forth between those two projects. And I think what's special about it is working on the family project is very micro. You know, we have our own vineyards here, our own winery here. Uh, most of the team has been here, you know, either 20 or 30 years. Um, the Artist Shastik project, I source fruit from all over California, 500 mile radius. So I go from Mendocino all the way down to Santa Barbara County, and I work with about 25 different growers across the state. So that gives me a very macro um, approach, um, and especially to the growing season. So it's kind of fun when people are in Napa are talking about the growing season, but I'm thinking about it, the growing season in Santa Barbara and Contra Costa County and the Sonoma Coast and Sonoma and Mendocino. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to have the exposure to a really amazing small family project and then go all over the state and source fruit. Yeah. So the, the, the name is Lardy Chasek, so it's Artie, Shannon, and Sicily. Uh, so uh, our son's name is Arthur the uh, Third. He's Artie. His dad's Art. Uh, and then Cicely is our daughter. Shannon's my name. So it's a combination of um, our three names into one. I love that. <laughs> what I'm curious. So if you had to describe um, this is a question for for both of you. Um, if you had to describe um, the difference between Chardonnay, let's say from Sonoma Coast versus Chardonnay from Napa and how it expresses itself in the glass. What do you think the key differences are? Well, I think that um, if you were to compare the Chardonnay that we produce on this estate, it has a, a tremendous amount of body um, because of our location. It's a bit of a riper growing location for Chardonnay, but we have a unique microclimate um, for our estate. We're at the base of the tallest mountain in the Western range. And so we get the very first shade of the day. And uh, the, the vines, the Chardonnay vines were planted in 1993, so they had a decent amount of age on them. And uh, actually quite a bit of virus too, which plays out well, ironically, um, because it slows down the ripening process. And yeah. so um, we inhibit malolactic fermentation on our Chardonnays because it doesn't have a lot of natural acidity um, at the onset. Um, we really want to enhance the brightness and freshness of the wine. Whereas if you're, if you're you know, purchasing fruit from the Sonoma Coast or growing fruit on the Sonoma Coast, your acid levels are much higher to begin with. So you might want to consider doing malolactic fermentation if you don't want that working acidity. Yeah. I think for, you know, for me, um, you know, obviously the microclimates are very different, um, but you know, I don't, I'm not in those vineyards every day. 
um, you know, Shannon is, is here on property every day. And Frederick is here on property every day. And Richard Villasenor, our vineyard foreman, is here. And um, I think it's a different approach when I'm picking out on the coast. I tend to lean a lot on my growers. Um, I'm not a micromanager of, of my growers. I feel like they've been there a long time. Uh, so it's very collaborative when it comes to the pick uh, because I'm going to need some inside information that they have because I can't physically be there all the time. Um, and that's why I choose to work with really special sites and experienced growers uh, because when you do that, they're doing kind of what they're doing out there and I'm doing what I'm doing out here. And if I drive out there once a month uh, initially and then you know maybe every week after that, I can – kind of lean on them to tell me what's happening. So I think how the information is transferring is, is, is just as important as the difference in the microclimate and the accessibility to the ocean. Got it. Oh, it's beautiful. And this is the 2018 vintage, which is not released yet, um, if I'm correct. But um, yes. if anyone's interested in, in learning about it um, or finding ways to acquire it, they can find you on Instagram at WineXYZ. That's that, correct. And then okay. at some point, maybe I'll work with Vanessa and we'll get some of this over to Wine Access. Absolutely. It would be an honor. Absolutely. My pleasure. So next, so this is, um, this is a project that I only actually learned existed um, in the, you know, pretty, pretty recently. So um, Raisa, so this, um, yeah. Shannon, I'd love for you to, to tell us about, about this project, but what I have here is the 2014 uh, Grenache from Sonoma County. Um, yeah. So, Shannon, tell us about Raisa. Yeah, so I wanted to pull some wines for us to share today that were a little unexpected and something that, some things that were new, right? Um, being the next generation, being, you know, the, the times that we're in, I think sometimes uh, we get so caught up in the, the seriousness and, and the weight of what we're doing that we forget to have a good time, right? And that's what it's really about. And so um, this, these two labels, I think, communicate that, that these wines are, are, they don't take themselves too seriously. We want them to be really kind of forward thinking and fun. Um, but this is uh, called Resa, which means journey in Swedish. And it's a project that I'm doing with Frederick Johansson, who's been our winemaker since 2007. Um, this is a Grenache. Uh, the, the vintage, as you said, is 2014. It comes from Sonoma Valley, uh, an organic vineyard there, farmed by Focatori. And um, it is a very small production. It's only like 60 cases available of this wine were made. 100% um, Grenache, uh, a small amount of full cluster. Uh, what we do from Stagland Family Vineyard when it comes to red wines can be a bit more on the um, finessed but full-bodied side. And I think that this wine really showcases uh, a more kind of medium-bodied, still very serious wine, but really pleasurable to drink. Um, will age really beautifully, but a little bit lighter in style. And, and that's something that we, we often can't keep light-bodied, medium-bodied red wines in our cellar or in our fridge because we drink them too fast. So yeah. they must really nice, but. <laughs> And what is it about Grenache in particular that, that drew you, aside from being a lighter-bodied? Yeah, you know, I think that the um, Grenaches can be super, um, almost feminine in a way. They have a lovely almost like floral component to them, um, in addition to some savory components and some minerality. So I love the complexity of the wine and how it can dance very lightly on your palate. Um, you know, Frederick was of course inspired by some of the, the most world renowned uh, Grenaches and that's how we kind of decided, well, this would be a great varietal to experiment with uh, and, and make a wine, not just experiment. Uh, and then we also do a Pinot Noir uh, from the, with the Resa label as well that comes from the Petaluma Gap, the west, western portion of the Petaluma Gap. So uh, a Grenache and a Pinot Noir, both kind of medium bodied, red wines, a lot of brightness, a lot of freshness, um, and, and very drinkable. Um, so Frederick's wife is, is Carissa Mondavi, and she's, she always says that you have to be careful because the bottle's gone before you know it. So, <laughs> so um, for, for anyone you know, at, at home who maybe isn't familiar with Whole Cluster, 
Can you explain why you, why Frederick uses that and what it imparts to the wine? So yeah, I think the stem contact um, can add, for me, I, I can go both ways on stem contact, right? If it's done, if there's too much in there, it's overpowering to me um, and I don't love it, but if there's the right amount, it integrates really well into the wine. Um, it does impact the, the, the chemical, uh, the chemistry of the wine, um, but I think, I don't know, Artie, yeah, you know, I mean, the pH, right? I think, uh, you know, stem inclusion uh, can be great for bringing a nice savory component uh, mm -hmm. to the wine, but you have to be very careful because you don't want to bring a stimmy component to the wine. So if you do use stem, the biggest question you want asked is are there stems in this wine? <laughs> because that means you've 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 done it with some level of finesse, whether it's 100 percent, 50 percent, or you know 15 percent. Um, stems also elevate the pH. So if you think about France, you know they're working with very very low pHs. So you know they from time to time use those stems to bring that mouth feel up, right? That's what you're gonna have on a higher pH wine. Uh, we're working kind of in the opposite. Uh, terroir over here where we're, we're already working with naturally high uh, pHs. So when we use stems, we have to be very careful that that pH doesn't get so elevated um, uh, to a point where the wine becomes unstable. So, I mean, it's, it's something that uh, I make Syrah also. And uh, this year, every year I do like one kind of interesting project. And this year I did a 100% whole cluster uh, Syrah. I still haven't been able to get Shannon to drink it yet. It's still a barrel. <laughs> but I wanted to see what the extreme what the extremes were. And I think there's definitely some amazing things that you can do with stems. But you have to it's very site specific and vintage specific. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't claim to be any kind of expert on, on stem inclusion, but I like what I saw and I like the way Frederick uh, uses them in these wines and I have a few other friends that, that do too. And I, I think it's that savory component for the new world that we're looking for. And in, in, in the old world, it might be, you know, that beautiful kind of textural uh, raising of the pH that they love. Yeah. I think, as you said, that, that sort of savoriness that it brings, but I also think it brings this sort of like beautiful perfume lift uh, mm -hmm. to the ones as well that I think, I think. Dramatically, really, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, add, add a beautiful expressiveness to this wine. So thank and you. Beautiful. Also, you know, this is the 14. So the first vintage we did of this wine is 13. And that vintage right now is like that floral component that you're talking about from the stem inclusion is just singing. It's so, so beautiful. I think we um, we tried that together, right? At um, at Sunday school at press, which um, yeah. <laughs> was really fun to, to hear you. So anyone at, at home, um, I don't know if it's still happening, but they used to do a like once a month, I think, uh, focus on one person and their story and wine. And I was lucky enough to, uh, sit in on Shannon's and, and taste that. So um, it's really great to taste the, the follow-up vintage. Um, yeah. So now I'm going to pour, so I have the 2014 vintage of the Bella Oaks um, Staglin Cabernet Sauvignon. So Shannon, your family has such an important, um, an amazing piece of, of Napa history behind them. Um, so I was curious, and I'd love to, I'd love to hear your perspective on this wine, but I'd also really love to hear what it's like for you personally, um, you know, as president now of the winery and, and taking over from your parents and kind of, um, you know, what's your day to day like? Yeah, well, just a little bit, I guess, on the history of this place to start, I think is great. And that ties into this wine as well. So our property is located on the Rutherford bench. And some of the first vineyards planted in Napa Valley were planted right here. So our estate was originally planted in 1864 uh, by John and Mary Spector. Uh, this fruit uh, in the wine um, that we're enjoying right now comes from the adjacent vineyard. So just across the creek line from us, so just towards the highway. Um, and it is from the um, Old Heights Bella Oaks vineyard. So it was owned by Bell and Barney Rhodes. And uh, they have an amazing story. Um, Barney was one of the original founders of Kaiser Permanente. And Bell is, can, can be accredited with bringing culinary arts to Napa Valley. So she was a huge believer in the chefs that we had here and really shone the light on them and their talent. And so they really, he, Barney was also one of the first collectors of Napa wines. And so his seller, speaking of press, um, when they passed away, 
status state seller, and that was their beginning list uh, at Press, which is known for historic Napa Valley wines at amazing prices, right? So, um, but they partnered with the Heights family for many years. They were growers. Um, they actually owned Martha's Vineyard and sold that to Martha. Um, so, it, and um, so great history there. And so they were friends of ours. They would come and have Thanksgiving meals with us, um, or when they got so old they couldn't make it, we would bring the food to them. And uh, we just had a really great connection with them. And when they passed on, um, we knew that the property was going to be coming up for sale. And so one of some of our friends from, from Texas were visiting, the Booth family, and my parents were walking around the vineyard with them, and they said, hey, you know, this property is going to be for sale. They said, well, you know, we definitely would love to buy it, but we don't know anything about the wine business. And my parents said, well, we'll help you. And so they ended up purchasing it, and um, we kind of uh, helped guide the, um, I guess, re-energization of that property. Um, so we, the, the vines that were there were planted in the, um, in the early 90s by Lori Wood, and that was all one clone and one rootstock. And so we wanted to start to introduce some new uh, new varietals, new tonal collections, new complexity to the wine. Uh, David Abreu started farming it at that time. And so it was really special to, you know, for the vintages of 12, 13, 14, and 15, be a part of what was happening there. So it was um, a moment in time for us, but a very important moment to kind of honor the past and bring it into the future. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's the that's the Bella Oaks, the Staglin 2014 Bella Oaks, um, and this is uh, some of the last old vines on the property. The the last vintage before they were all torn out was 2015. So, got it. And I think so, uh, you know things have been moving quickly for us uh, yeah. in the past few years with you know having our children and getting married and everything. But these wines are special to me because this is when I started working with the family business. So. Um, I when I moved here, I started working at Harlan Estate, and, uh, and then after that, was fortunate to work on the My Commons Vineyards project. And you know, we had our, our two children, and I was getting pulled in a million different directions. And I think it was time for us to have the conversation of how can I, you know, contribute to the family business. So yeah. uh, I started working with uh, the Booth Bella Oaks project in a small capacity, and then kind of segued on to doing more uh, for the family when needed. But I, I, I really love this project because it reminds me of, of kind of starting to, to work in the family business. And like, I think, you know, my role and also Shannon's role, even though they're, they're different, you know, Shannon is president, she's running the company with her mother and, and uh, you know, I'm working in client services. I think both of our jobs is to carry on the tradition. And you can't really carry on a tradition until you understand it. So. Mm-hmm. The fact that we get to work together with her parents and you know hear these amazing stories and and work with you know most of the team that they hired and their vineyard crew that they've been working with i think that's a very special part of this this process and these wines right here you know i think all the wines we've tasted they they represent innovation and you know we're fortunate to have a very strong napa valley brand but we want to continue to innovate and be be relevant so to have the son-in-law doing his own project and to have, you know, the daughter doing a project with, with our longtime winemaker and then to make wines off of the historic property next door. I think that shows that Garrett and Sherry want to continue to innovate. And as we want this to be a generational business, we have to continue to stay strong with the tradition. But one thing we can't do is be stagnant. And Artie, did you did you grow up around wine, or did you find it later in life? <laughs> I found it later in life. You know, um, I grew up. My parents were pretty, were pretty pretty religious Baptist folks, so there wasn't a whole lot of drinking going on. And I also um, played sports my whole life, so uh, all the way through college. So I didn't really drink through college, but uh, I always thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. And uh, I played at the University of Texas, and like ninety. I don't know what the stat is, 98% of collegiate athletes who do not play professional sports, you have to figure out some kind of way to make a living. So mentally, I don't think I was ready to to go work for a blue chip company. <laughs> so I started, working in, uh, I started working in restaurants in Austin and then moved to New York City and had the opportunity to work at Nobu in Tribeca and then went down to Miami and, um, and worked with some wine programs down there. And 
you know, now I think a lot about, uh, you know, I still have friends that work in the restaurant business and what this has all done to them. Uh, and so I have a lot of compassion for the folks that are out there, the sommeliers that we work with, um, the chefs uh, that we've done amazing dinners with. Uh, we, we think about those folks every day and, and we hope that we can just continue to move uh, forward and get everybody back on their feet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess a follow-up question to that. So already coming from a, you know, a non-wine background and Shannon growing up in the wine business, what do you think the advantages and disadvantages of both of those are? Hmm. That's a good, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, I think for an easy one is the advantage of me growing up in this business is that I, I, I've learned through osmosis. Um, so, you know, you can ask me pretty much any question about this property, about our wines, and I should be able to answer it. And if I can't, then that's a good question. And, and, uh, but it's just all I've learned over time. And so, um, it's, my recall was very quick and very easy and kind of natural. Um, I also think having grown up in this business and been very active in this community when I came back to the family business after college. Um, I have a tremendous network of friends uh, and uh, both professional relationships and just straight friendships or both um, that I can lean on and look to. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, as you said earlier, it takes a village, right? So um, it is a true community here in Napa Valley. Um, I think a, a, a disadvantage would be that, um, you know, I carry the weight of knowing that this was created and I have to carry it forward and not screw it up, right? <laughs> and so um, maybe I'm more cautious in, in the way in which I do things than I would be if I had created it myself. Um, but I have a, a very entrepreneurial husband who likes to, to um, always encourage me to think outside the box, which is good. That's great. I mean, I mean, uh, for me, I think the, you know, the, I don't know. I'd, I'd be hard pressed to find some disadvantages. I think the advantage is not having not come from it. Um, I have a lot of enthusiasm every day. You know, it's still kind of like uh, not real. You know, and I think I take that enthusiasm every day. Uh, you know, when we were dating, I was living in in Miami. So, call it intensity. Yeah. <laughs> you think about, uh, oh, one day I'm going to go to the wine country and I'm going to live there. And everything is one day. And then all of a sudden it happens. And, um, and, and you appreciate it so much. And I think not having come from it, I, my appreciation level is very high. Uh, one thing I will say was, you know, when I worked in the restaurant business, most of the time I ran wine programs. So when I started making wine, I knew that I could always lean on my palate, whether it was tasting grapes, fermenting grape juice, uh, finished wines, uh, wines uh, in bottle, aged wines. I knew like whether something tasted good or not. Uh, I didn't know initially how to get there. Um, that's where I had to lean on you know, people like Frederick, uh, mentors, right, um, to help me. Uh, so I think the advantage is the enthusiasm that I carry, that I'm very fortunate to be here. And, and I'm also fortunate to, to help in any way I can with our family business. Um, and that's what's a, it's a great opportunity. And like I said, as a son-in-law, as a daughter, uh, you have to know your role, you know. And I, I work with Shannon's parents, and I work with Shannon, too, to constantly kind of go over, like, what is my role? Because I think every team... Where every company is as, as great as their weakest link. So if I'm strong, we're stronger. If I'm weak, we're less strong. So I think the advantage is to know what I don't know and, and look at how I can contribute. Um, well, we have one comment from uh, from a home viewer, which is uh, Sir Lucero, <laughs> Master Sony, who on our team at Wine Access, who says he can't wait to have you for, for dinner sometime soon. So, yes. Looking forward to that. Can, can I be invited is my next yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, and Melanie from home says we love Stadlin and Jamie. Hello, Melanie. Hi, <laughs> Melanie. is our hospitality manager. <laughs> 
One, um, another question. Um, so we've been talking a lot. The word family has come up a, a lot in this conversation. And so I'm curious, what do you think as a family, uh, family owned winery, what do you think are your new and unique challenges versus the ones that your parents faced? Well, um, you know, COVID-19 has opened up a whole new can of worms, right? <laughs> so, I mean, just in the present moment, like uncertainty, right? And we all know that, like, we're not going to return back to the way things were. There's going to be a new normal. And what is that? And how do we navigate that? And um, how do we think ahead to prepare ourselves for what that's going to look like, um, I think is really important. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the my old answer to that before this hit would have been relevancy. So, you know, Stagnum Family Vineyard has been a brand and a well-known brand uh, for, you know, about 30-ish years now. And so there's always, there has been a lot of new, uh, new brands that come into the forefront and come into the marketplace and people get really excited about them. And so even though we've been making wine and making great wine consistently for 30 years, you know, sometimes there's a new shiny object that they would like to have instead. And so, um, you know, even though, um, you know, we sell our wines on allocation, we have to remain um, present and in front of people, whether it's uh, through Facebook Live or in person at a dinner or uh, whatever that will be, um, but really staying connected um, with the people that are enjoying our wine so they can really understand what our family story is and what makes us special and unique. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I'm very passionate about, um, you know, when clients come to Napa, uh, you know, we want to show them a great time. We want to we want to make sure that that they leave and they're so excited that they think about planning their next trip. Um, so the client experience is something that I'm very passionate about. I, I, I feel like we can't rest on our laurels in terms of taking care of the client. Uh, and, and what this global pandemic has done, uh, you know, and you think about our clients not being able to come on property, you know, when clients are on property, that's the time to show them something that they can't see from afar. You know, so all of the senses are involved, you know, the smell, the taste, the sight, the sound, you know, the birds on the vineyard. So I think we have to continue to be energized about, if we, you know, if we have an hour and a half with clients here on property, let's let's make it action packed. Let's show them all this. Let's show them a day in the life of what we what we are fortunate to do here every single day. So I think our, our hospitality team and, and our management team, I think we'll be even more excited than we were before about showing our clients what a special place this is and the wines are delicious i mean they come off a great property experienced winemaker great proprietorship um but let's let's talk about the the, the other things that make us excited too so you know let's not make it about the wines 100 percent of the time let's talk about this special place let's talk about the family let's talk about the wine business let's like engage our our clients in a cerebral way and show them the special place that we get to be in. Yeah. So my last question uh, involves family too. So I know you uh, you have children. Um, you know, do you hope that they follow in your footsteps? And if they do, what is the best piece of advice you could give them? Um. So my parents never forced me or pushed me to go into the wine business. They let me find my own way. And I didn't want to have anything to do with it, of course, growing up or in high school. But then going away to college, having some distance between me and family, the place, the business, I kind of was like, oh, wow, that looks like it might be kind of fun, right? Uh, so I came back to it on my own. So I think that I would want our kids to find it in that way as well. Um, you know, they're, they're growing up here on this property. Um, they're, you know, out in the vineyards with the guys when they're pruning, they taste the grapes along the way. Um, they, they're, they're bilingual, so they speak both Spanish and English, um, which I think will be a huge advantage for them. Um, and uh, again, like the osmosis, just learning by being here, I think is gonna be really impactful. Um, but yeah, so I would want them to find their own way. And then the best 
advice. Do you have something top of mind? Um, you know, I, I, with, our, with our children, they're very fortunate, right? Like, they're fortunate to grow up in Napa, which is a very safe, clean environment, you know, clean air, clean water. You know, we have a, a you know certified organic vineyard here that they get to run around on. So, you know, the, the, our kids are very fortunate. And, and the main thing that I want them to do is to never forget that. Um, you know, we're, speaking of travel, you know, Shannon was talking about taking the kids down to Guatemala because she's got some friends that live down there. But that's going to be very important. It's going to be important for us to take our kids around the globe and see, you know, people that are less fortunate or they could see that right here in the United States. So if you have this special moment in time to work on a special family project like this, my advice would be to be extremely humble, but and to work extremely hard, but also figure out what your contribution is. Everyone on this property, on this team has a very strong contribution. They know their role. Um, and so as they come in, even though eventually they will be the proprietors, they still have to understand what their role is at that time. Uh, and the final thing is to, you know, respect our team, you know, respect our farm workers. Without our farm workers, we, would, we wouldn't have a business. So, you know, respect the accounting department because they, they cut the checks for people. And <laughs> respect our hospitality people because they might have to do three or four tastings a day and polish glassware. So, you know, I wouldn't tell them anything that, that my parents haven't told me is like, a lot of humility and hard work goes a long way. Yeah, and I think starting, you know, learning from the ground up. Like my first job when I graduated from college in 2001 was to be a harvest intern. And so I was, Andy Erickson was our winemaker that year. And it was his first year as being the head winemaker. He had been an assistant at Harlan. Uh, so I was his first ever harvest intern. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> you know, I learned, I learned, it was a crazy time, actually, speaking of crazy times because that was nine that was when 9 11 happened that september and you know i was working in the, our brand new caves they were like half dug out we were half at wine at um, napa wine company still half in our own winery caves and just you know wearing rubber boots and washing things and just so much manual labor and i but i learned so much about the winemaking process by doing that that it really gave me such a such a strong foundation to then move into the business side and be able to talk about the wines and how we make them and and really kind of get into that and, and earned uh, like so much more respect when I spoke to people. Whereas when I would go out on sales calls before that, people would walk all over me because I had no idea what I was talking about. So, <laughs> uh, so great yeah, start as a harvest intern. Start as, I think it's like it's like food service, right? Like everyone in the world should have to work in food service at some point, right? Um, if you, if you want to be in the wine business, you have to be a harvest intern at some point. It just should be, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a requirement. Uh, well, thank you. A harvest intern. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see your faces. I miss seeing you in person, but um, these wines are beautiful, um, and so. Um, just to follow up, so Artie, that um, people can find you on Instagram at WineXYZ. Find me on right? Instagram, WineXYZ, absolutely. Follow me, I'll follow you. And then for the Risa, they can um, e email you right info at? At RisaWine.com, yep. Okay. The Staglin available at Wine Access. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> So thank you for sharing these and sharing your time. And you're getting some love from home too. Uh, Brian, who's watching from home, says one of my favorite wineries. And um, uh, couldn't thank you, Brian. <laughs> well, much thank love you, to you guys. too. Look yeah. forward to sharing your glass in person on the other side of this. Okay. But thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.